the song is so, 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 so beautiful. The lyrics are so powerful. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God sent his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. You know, the whole the whole Bible from start to finish tells us about the never ending, unconquerable love of God towards his people. And the Bible tells us that through this love, God has sent his only son to die so that not one of us, not me, not you, not anybody on this call today should have to taste death. And not only that, he promises us eternal life, but all the power that God has, all the ability that he has, he has said that we can have. It's available to us right here, right now, if we would only believe if we would believe, if we would only believe and have faith. The message today is entitled, Simply Believe. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I hand this moment completely over to you, completely over to you, Lord. You know that in my preparation, all I've been seeking for is just to hear your words. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would forgive me of my sins, that you would cleanse me from my unrighteousness, that you would forgive us all, dear Lord, for the things that we have done, which has caused you to hide your face from us. But, Lord, right now, we just wait to hear a word from you through your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your wondrous goodness towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. The word believe, what does it mean? The word belief means a conviction based on testimony that something or someone is something is true or that someone is reliable. The conviction that something is true or that someone is reliable. The state or the habit of mind in which trust or confidence is placed in some person or something. In the Old Testament, the word translated to believe or faith means to be steady or to be firm or to be trustworthy, or to accept as true, or to accept that something is sure, sure. You know, often in today's society, we ask people, what do you believe in? What do you believe in? Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in Santa Claus? Do you believe in magic? Do you believe in love? Do you believe in life after death? Do you believe in climate change or is it just a big hoax? Do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in your own ability? But the question that we really have to consider and I want to ask us all to reflect on today is, do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? Do you believe God's word? Now that might sound like a silly question to be sat asking believers on the Sabbath day in church if we believe in God. Because, yes, no doubt, we have, at some level, a belief in God. Otherwise, we would not be sat here right now. But I propose to you that the belief in God that we hold is, no, is nowhere near, nowhere near the level of the belief that we should have in God if we really, really knew who God was. If we really understood who God was, I propose that the belief that we would have would be dramatically dramatically above what we have right now we got to understand one thing is that since the beginning of time belief in god's word the veracity of god's word the reliability of god's word has been under attack since the very beginning go with me to genesis chapter 2 Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. 
Genesis 2. And I'm going to read verse 17. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. It says, God speaking, but the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Clear, real clear. Flip over the page to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. All these are very, very familiar texts. Very familiar texts. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, what did the serpent say? Ye shall not surely die. Ye shall not surely die. So God said, if you eat from the tree, you will die. And Satan said, God, is God's word really true? Does God, did God really mean what he said? Can you really trust what God said? Now, you see, the reason that Satan has this approach is because Satan himself disbelieved God's word, distrusted in God's word, and trusted in himself. Satan disbelieved God, trusted in himself, and as a result was thrown out of heaven. And now, on this earth, Satan's role, Satan's goal, performed and executed very successfully, is to cause man, me and you, to disbelieve God's word, disbelieve God, and trust in self. All throughout the history of mankind, from the Garden of Eden up until this very day, the battle that rages in this earth right now is between belief in God or belief in self. Do I trust what God has said to be true? Or do I believe in my own word above the word of God? The battle rages in the earth. And sadly, sadly, the battle rages in the church the battle rages in the church whereby even us professed believers of God still are wrestling with this question. Do I believe, do I really believe God and do I really believe his word? So first thing we need to do, we need to understand the character of God. We need to understand the character of God. The first thing we need to know about God is that God is love. God is not loving. God is love the bible says in first john chapter 4 verse 7 and 8 in fact let's go there first john chapter 4 first john chapter 4 verse 7 behold sorry beloved let us love one another for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. This is the first thing we need to know about God. God is love. The second thing we need to understand about God is that God, God only deals in truthfulness. God only deals in truth. Romans chapter 2, verse 2 says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says clearly, God cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 reinforces this point, emphasizing the fact that it is impossible, it's impossible for God to lie. God is love. God is is truth and he can not tell a lie one other thing we need to know about god is that god expects total and utter surrender to him total surrender to him 
executed and demonstrated through obedience to his word. We can read the, the, the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4 to help us understand about what God expects from his people. Even going back to Genesis, the story, the story we just read, God expects that his people would follow his word to the letter. And as God said, when you eat from the tree, you will die. Satan says, mm -mm, that's not true. Will you, will you really die? Let's understand something about Satan. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, verse 44. I would encourage you, if you're not looking these verses up, write them down and look them up in your own time. Don't listen to something that I said because I said it, but look at it and check it out for yourself. John chapter 8, verse 44. So we want to understand about the nature and the character of Satan. Jesus speaking, speaking to godly people, speaking to the church. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so we're told clearly here that Satan, Satan is a liar. And not only that, but Satan is the father of lies. And so when we see um, mistruth, when we see dishonesty, in fact, when we are dishonest, the Bible tells us that we are adhering to our father, Satan. Satan is selfish. Isaiah chapter 14 brings this out very clearly. Satan is selfish. So Satan's only concern is I. Me, 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 me. Me. Satan is all about me. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You know, when you look in the world today, I don't know about you, but I see this very character trait, this very characteristic, which is almost universal in humankind today the characteristic which says that above all things, the most important thing in the world is me. Me, what I want, what I need, what I like. The Bible says that this is a characteristic of Satan. And finally, Satan is worldly. Satan is worldly. And I mean worldly and carnal as opposed to spiritual. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. And verse 23, it reads, But he turned and said unto Peter, Jesus speaking, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. <coughs> Mercy. So Jesus is speaking here to one of his dear, dearest, nearest disciples and saying that because of your love of worldly things, because of your love of carnal things, because you are not so into spiritual things, you are more like your father, Satan, than my father, the creator. And so we have two ideologies two ideologies battling and fighting for, for obedience from man. We have the ideology of God, which is based on love and truth. And we have the ideology of Satan, which is based on self and lies and worldliness. Satan says, you can't trust God. You can't trust God. You can't believe in God's word. What you want to do is decide for yourself what to do. 
decide for yourself. You know, you, you can make your own mind up. You have a brain. You can decide for yourself what's good for you. But God says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And so Satan says that what God has planned for you is not going to end up well. God's plan for you is boring. God doesn't know what's best for you. You decide for your own, your own path forward and it will work out better. God doesn't know what, what's best for you. You can decide for yourself what's best for you. But, but God says in Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so someone, someone, both can't be telling the truth. Somebody has to be, to be lying. Either Satan is true or God is true. Satan says that if you follow yourself, if you distrust God's word, disbelieve his word and follow yourself, trust in yourself, it will be more enjoyable. It will be more fun. It will be better for your life. But God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has even entered into the heart of man. Some versions say it's not even entered into your imagination the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. God says, my ideals for your life are so lofty, are so wonderful, are so amazing, beautiful, lovely in every way. But what does Satan say? Really? Does God really mean that? Is that really true? Is that really true? Look around you. Nobody else is following him. And they all seem to be having great, a great time. Is, is your life really going to be better if you submit all and follow him? Satan wants you to doubt what God has said plainly in his word. Satan wants you to disbelieve what God has said in his word. But God says, I am not like you. I am not like you. So no matter how much Satan says, disregard his word, don't believe in his word. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it says that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? You know, sometimes we read about the God of the Bible and we, for some reason, think, believe, doubt, fear that perhaps God is not the same today. So we see the miracles wrought in the Bible. We see all the things that God's people were able to do through faith and belief in God in the Bible. But for some reason, we are not, because we don't see it, it's understandable. For some reason, we don't, we're not 100% convinced that this is the same God. But Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. I change not. And so we should be able to have faith and belief that God, the same God who caused the children of Israel to go through the sea on dry land, the same God that worked in the disciples to cause them to preach the word and to be heard in numerous different languages simultaneously, the same God that brought the conversion of thousands of souls in each day. This is the same God that we serve today, brethren. All of these things are available to be harnessed for the benefit of God's work. But we have to believe. We have to believe. And so in your finances, Satan says that you need to work as hard as you can to support yourself and sustain yourself. You need to make sure that you are feathering your nest, doing everything in your power, because you can't really trust God to look after you. Whereas God says, seek me first. Seek my righteousness first. And all the other things that you are worrying about, all the bills, 
all the clothes, the food, the shelter, all those things that you're stressing about, I will provide them for you. Do we believe in God is what we have to ask ourselves. God says, if you obey me, none of these diseases will I put on you. So if you follow my commands, if you eat the things I say and drink the things I say and live the way I say and avoid the things that I say, I will put none of these diseases on you. But Satan says, eat whatever you want. You can decide. You can decide what's best for you to eat. You, it tastes nice, so eat it. You can decide what's best for you to drink and to do with your time. You can decide for yourself. It's, it'll be fine. Relationships. God says, a man would leave his family and will cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. God says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. But what does Satan say? Satan says, that woman, she's prettier than your wife. She's slimmer than your wife. She's younger than your wife. If you go with her, it will be better than what you have at home. He says that that man, he's more handsome than your husband. He's earning more money than your husband. If you go with him, life will be better with him. God says a man would leave his home and go with his wife. What does Satan say? Satan says, although you are a man and he is a man, it, it feels good. It feels right. So just do whatever feels right. Is God serious? Is it, is it really an abomination? Is what Satan says. That, that guy, God says, don't be unequally yoked. I know, but you know, you're single and that guy, he's nice and he's nice to you and he's respectable. He doesn't believe in God, but he likes you. Why, why can't you go with him? It feels right. God says, don't work on the Sabbath day. Rest on the Sabbath day and do no work. Satan says, you need the money. And because of the job that you do, technically, you can justify doing it. So will God really judge you for wanting to provide for your family? God says, dress with modesty and sobriety, not with the outward display of jewels, etc., makeup, etc. But Satan says, everybody else is doing it. It's fine. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. If you didn't do it, you'll look out of place. So you might as well go ahead. And really, is it that big a deal? Brethren, do you recognize, and I want you to take a little moment to really um, reflect on this, what I'm, I'm about to say. Do you recognize every negative experience in life and in the world is because of distrust in God and trust in self? I'll say that again. Every, every, every single negative experience in life, every tear, every heartbreak, every loss, every sadness, every sickness, every death, every disappointment, every family breakdown, every marriage breakdown, every tear shed, every negativity experienced in life is because of distrust in God and trust in self. Every single negative thing you've ever known, heard of, seen, read about is because of distrust in God and trust in self. Despite this, despite this, we still, still don't believe God at his word, despite this. So we live in this world and we see all the, the heartache and the hardship, but despite that, we still will not fully, and I mean fully, take God at his word. I want to tell you three things about God which should help us to be able to submit all to him. The first thing is, God is all powerful. All powerful, omnipotent, all powerful. The Bible says in Matthew 19, 26, that with God, all things are possible. Revelation chapter one, verse eight says, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the almighty, almighty, 
all powerful. Every power that could ever be manifested is contained in your God and my God. If Isaiah 43 verse 13 says, Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Other versions says, who can, who can withstand it? So if I want to do something, says God, who can stop me? Nobody can stop him because he is all powerful. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Oh, wow. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, this verse here. Speaking about Jesus, he says that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, when you first read, well, when I first read that, I thought, shouldn't that say by the power of his word? But when you actually study and understand what that is saying, it's saying that the word of God is a, an outworking or a manifestation of his power. It's, it, it's saying that the power of God is contained in his word. And so this God with all power in heaven and earth, when he speaks, that's why last week we studied in Sabbath school, that when God speaks, things happen because in his word is all power, all power. And so the first thing we need to know about God is that he has all power. There's nothing. And I know we we know this, but I want it to sink into our souls. There is not a single thing that you want to do or that you want to start, or that you want to stop, or that you want to change, or that you want to achieve, that he cannot do. Nothing at all. Number two, God is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. What that means is, God knows everything that ever could have ever been known. So every knowledge, every event, Every situation, every thought, every action, God knows it all. Not only that, God knows everything that will ever happen and everything that is happening right now. Not only that, God knows everything that could ever happen and that could ever be known. There isn't any knowledge that could ever be acquired in the world which God does not already have possession of and more besides. God knows absolutely everything everything. Psalm 147 verse 5 says, great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite, infinite. First John chapter 3 verse 20 says, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And Acts 15 verse 18 says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. God knows everything that could ever be known. And so, if God knows everything, or no, let me rephrase that. If I believe, if I believe that God knows everything, would I not want to and be willing to submit everything of my being into his hands? If God knows everything, Would I not want to give him all control over my life because he knows things I don't know, will never know, and could never know? He knows what will happen tomorrow, next year, the year after, whereas my understanding is so clouded and limited. Would it not make sense to give myself into his hands? I propose the reason that we don't do that is because we don't fully know the character of God because I might think, if I submit to me, now, if you submit yourself to me, I wouldn't personally advise that, personally. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an okay guy on my day. I have some redeeming features about me, but I'm not necessarily 100% reliable. So I might have a good intention to do things. I might have the full idea that I would do right by you. But then the time may come that I may forget. I may have my hands full with too many other things and I might just overlook it. I might change my mind. I might, any, any number of things would happen whereby trusting yourself into my hands might not be such a good idea. But God has all power 
and knows all things. And then the third thing is God is perfect. God's love towards you and me is perfect. Is perfect. Omnibenevolent. God is omnibenevolent. His love towards you is perfect. Total love. Perfect love. And so if we put it together, well, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we, me, <laughs> me, you, wicked as we are, should be called the sons and daughters of God. John chapter 15, verse 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And so if, if you put it together, we can believe God because God is truth. We can submit all to God because God has all the power in the world. So the best way to think about it is everything that you are not that's positive, he is. And everything that you are that's negative, he is not. And so all of my weakness, God is powerful. All of my sinfulness, God is pure and righteous and holy. All of my stupidity and my ignorance, God is all wise and all knowing. Not only that, all of the things I don't see, God knows and sees everything. And the reason I can entrust all of me to him is because his love and care for me is more than I can even contemplate with my tiny little mind. And so if you submit to me, that's a problem. If you submit to God, all you are doing is submitting yourself to omnipotent power, to ultimate knowledge, and to complete and total love. Now, that's why I, I think we don't know God. We can't know God truly, because if we knew that, belief in him, submission to him, surely it's not a big deal. It's a, it's a rational thing to do. It's a rational thing to do. But what does Satan say? Satan says, he can't, he can't. Can you really trust that he's going to do what he said he would do? Can you really trust it? The truth is, not only does God love us perfectly, but God says that we should also love others perfectly. In John chapter 15, verse 17, just on from where it says, greater love hath no man than this. It says that these things I command you, that you love one another. And the truth is, we, I was, I've written here that we struggle to do it on our own. Excuse me. The truth is, we cannot, under any circumstances, do it on our own. But, but, knowing this, God, in his ultimate wisdom and beauty and love, in John chapter 3, verse 16, as we have read and as we know, God loved us so much that he gave his only son, that whoever believes, believes in him, believes in him, believes, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everything, everything that you should ever want to accomplish, everything of value that you will ever accomplish will be wrought in through faith in Christ through belief in Christ. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 says that the just shall live by faith. The just, everything about the just, they're established, we are established in faith in God. We need to get to the place where we can surrender everything that we have to God. Everything that we have to God. Now, I've put it to you that this is not, this should not be a fearful thing. This should not be a worrisome thing because God makes available to us total power. God makes available to us total providence and God makes available to us total love. The Bible says that without faith, it's, it's not possible to be pleasing to God. It's not possible to please him. Without believing in him, it's not possible because it says in, in Hebrews 11:6 6 that whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
also in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19. Can you believe it? The verse is speaking about, about the children of Israel passing over into the land of Jordan. As we know, who studied our Bible, the, that story is a, a type of our journey into the heavenly kingdom in the antitype. The Bible says that in Hebrews 3.19, that many could not enter because of unbelief because of unbelief. And so they'd gone on this whole journey through the wilderness, 40 years up and down, in and out. And if you think about all the things that the children had seen by them, so they had seen how God had rained down the plagues on Egypt. They'd seen how he led them through the, the, the sea on dry land. They'd seen how he fed them every day with manna from heaven, yet still, Despite this, many could not enter in because of unbelief. Do you believe in God? Do you believe God's word? Jesus recognizing that this would be an issue in the end of time in Luke 18, 18, he asked the question, <coughs> wondering to himself, when I return to the earth, will I find faith here? Will I find faith? Will I come back to the earth? And will anybody still believe? Or will belief be a thing of the past? The Bible says, if you ask anything, anything, believing, you will have it. This is not my words. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22, write it down and, and check it for yourself. If you ask anything, believing, you will have it. All things are possible to someone who believes. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. No caveats. All things. All things. Think about the things you're struggling with right now. Think about your struggles. Think about the work that you're trying to find. Think about the issues you're having in your home life with your children, with your wife, with your husband. Think about the issues you're having in your work with your manager. Think about the issues you're having in your body, in your bones, in your limbs not doing what you want them to do. The Bible says, all things are possible to those who believe. The Bible says that through belief, the sick were healed, the dead were raised to life, armies were defeated, kingdoms were subdued, the sea became dry land, all according to belief. How many times did Jesus heal? And what did he say? According to your belief, be it so unto you. According to your belief. According to your belief. Satan says God cannot be trusted. Satan says that God's word is not real and you can't take it seriously. But you and I, the church, we are here to be a witness to everybody to show them that the power, the providence, and the love of God still reigns supreme. Still. People should look at our lives. And because we are totally submitted to him, God's power, God's providence, and God's love should be emanating from everything that we do. Everything that we do. God's church is supposed to be a beacon of light set on a hill in a dark and a cold world. The church has no power because we do not believe what God has said. We share the same level of disbelief as the world. And because of, it, because of that, our lives are reflective and representative just like the world, exactly the same as them. And so people look at us and they can only side with Satan because it must be true what he's saying. Satan says God's word cannot be believed. Look at God's people. Look at God's people. If his word could be believed, surely they wouldn't be like the way they are. Surely. Surely. Simply, I leave with this. In Mark chapter 9, in Mark chapter 9, a very, a very well-known um, turn of phrase, Jesus said, if they would believe, then your child will be healed. He said, 
in verse 23, Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believe. And the man, the father of the child cried out, said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Brethren, God wants to do an amazing, an amazing, an unbelievable work through you, through me, through us. God wants to reproduce his character. Bear in mind, his character is based on what? On truth, on love, on power, and on wisdom. God wants to reproduce all of those in us so that we would show forth his praises to the people around us, lifting up Jesus and drawing all men unto him. And then what happens next? The end will come. The end will come. God wants us to finish the work, to finish the work. No, no, no. Let me rephrase that. I apologize. God wants us to let him finish the work through us. It's not my work. It's not your work. God wants us to let him finish the work through us. But we can only do that if we would completely surrender everything we have to him. Everything that we have but surrender to that God, to this God, to our God, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving. That's a rational thing to do. That's a rational thing to do. That's not a silly thing to do. That's rational, completely rational. And so if you, like me, would like to pray today, Lord, I do believe, and I believe that we all believe. We have a, an element of belief. But if you want to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, just raise your hands. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you. We know that your word is true. And we know that, Lord, you who proclaimed it, you are faithful and true. Dear Father, Christ said that all, all power is given unto him in heaven and earth. All power. And Lord, I know that all of these things can be availed by us if we would only believe. Dear Father, we believe, but I just pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help our unbelief. And Lord, may we submit all to you. In fact, Lord, take our hearts because we cannot give it. And Lord, may, when you have done that, may you work in us and through us and finish the work. We thank you because we believe that you have already said it to be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'd like to thank Elder Kerry very much for his message of hope reassurance. You know, and I think there was something in there for all of us, children, adults, whoever we think we are. You know, there's something in there for all of us so that we will have the strength to all unto the Lord. You know, and Sister White mentioned something that she asked the angel as he was speaking. I remember reading it in one of the testimonies where she asked the angel, Why is it that there's no more faith in Israel? And she said, The angel said to her, Because we let go of the harms of the Lord too soon. So when we should be holding on, that is when we let go of the Lord. And therefore, I'd like to encourage us, as we did hear the word from your manservant, that we will hold on to the Lord, that we will continue to have that faith and belief so that the world will see Jesus in everything that we say and do. So thank you, my helper, for that message of encouragement. And I pray that all of us will leave with that message in our heart. Mm -hmm.